What would you do if the life you're accustomed to just fell apart and suddenly there's no electricity, no running water, and empty store shelves? What do you do now? Now, I'm not here to scare you, but I do think it's important to be prepared, just in case. Imagine this. You wake up in the morning, everything seems normal, but then the lights flicker and go out. The radio crackles with static. Your phone's dead. It's like stepping into a weird, quiet movie. The first day or two might be confusing. People might be in denial, hoping it's all just a big misunderstanding. But as the hours tick by, reality starts to sink in. You head to the store, hoping to grab some bottled water and canned goods, but the shelves are already bare. Now you can feel the panic setting in. This is the calm before the storm, folks. It's that deceptive period where everything seems the same, but beneath the surface, things are starting to unravel. This is your time to act. Remember all those times you thought about putting together an emergency kit? This is when it matters most. Here's the thing. Research shows that within three days of a crisis, stores can be completely depleted of essentials. If they're not being restocked, that means no water, no food, no batteries. And trust me, when people get desperate, things can get ugly. Think back to the last big power outage in your area. I'm sure people were pretty stressed, right? Now imagine that stress multiplied by a hundred, with no end in sight. That's when looting and vandalism can start to happen. By the third day, you might be looking at a world with no running water, no electricity, a totally different way of life. Suddenly, keeping food fresh becomes a major challenge. Finding clean water is paramount. Empty grocery store shelves become a constant reminder of the new normal. It's estimated that, without resupply, a grocery store can be completely emptied within three days of a disaster. Or, if you'll believe it, even sooner than this. Maybe even within a day. That rapid depletion, combined with a breakdown in the supply chain, creates a perfect storm. Civility might start to fray. People might resort to anything to survive, even if it means conflict. Fast forward to the end of the first week, the reality has well and truly set in. Without law enforcement and with resources dwindling, desperation takes hold. Crime rates could begin to skyrocket. Gone are the days of swiping your credit card. Banking systems might be down, rendering your cards useless. Even cash could lose its value, replaced by barter systems based on what people need most. Here's the kicker. Some people might choose to leave their homes, seeking better prospects, a glimmer of hope. History shows us that during crises, people tend to move towards areas with more resources, trying to find some form of stability. The first week of a collapse would be a true test of humanity. Communities that stick together and support each other might stand a better chance. But one thing's for sure, the bonds that hold us together would be stretched beyond anything we've ever experienced. Remember when I mentioned the first week would be a test? Buckle up, because things are about to get real during week two. Imagine a world where the ambulance doesn't come when you call, the fire trucks are silent, and the police are nowhere to be found. That's the reality we're looking at in the following weeks of a collapse. These folks who risk their lives to keep us safe, they'll be taking care of their own families just like everyone else. It's a harsh truth, but it's a sign of just how fragile our social order really is. Think about it. How would you handle a medical emergency without a doctor or hospital? This is especially scary for those who rely on regular medication or ongoing treatment. Sadly, history shows us that mortality rates for vulnerable populations can skyrocket during these situations. It's like a war zone, where medical care just disappears. Here's another thing. Remember all those conveniences we take for granted, like running water? Well, many areas will likely see that things are starting to run dry. Those fancy electric pumps that keep the water flowing? Yeah, they won't work without power. Suddenly, basic needs become a major challenge. Now, on top of all that, tensions will rise. People will be desperate. Food, water, shelter, these things become the new currency. And when people are desperate, things can get ugly. Imagine gangs fighting over scraps, or entire neighborhoods erupting in riots. It's not a pretty picture, but it's something we need to consider. Remember the big blackout in New York a few years back? People were on edge, tempers flared. Now imagine that, but with no end in sight. That's the kind of environment we're talking about here. But here's the thing, it's not all doom and gloom. 
Being prepared isn't just about stockpiling supplies, it's also about your mental state. How will you cope with the stress, the fear, the uncertainty? It's about building your inner strength and learning to adapt to a completely different way of life. Think about it. The skills you learned camping or gardening, those could become invaluable. The ability to stay calm under pressure, that's a superpower in a world gone haywire. In the meantime, remember, knowledge is power. The more you know, the better prepared you'll be to face whatever comes your way. Week three after a collapse would be a crucible, folks. A time of intense pressure that will forge a new reality. Remember that initial grocery store rush from week one? By week three, those empty shelves will be a constant reminder of the new normal. The initial panic buying will have subsided, replaced by a cold, calculating hunger. Those who stockpiled essentials, water, food, basic hygiene products, will have a clear advantage. I remember my grandpa, a man who lived through the Great Depression, telling me a story about bartering. He'd trade his carpentry skills for a chicken or some vegetables from a nearby farm. That kind of resourcefulness will be key. People might start offering services in exchange for goods, a haircut for a loaf of bread, a couple batteries for some medicine. The cracks in society will become wide chasms by week three. People in urban areas, especially those with limited resources, might decide to leave for greener pastures. Imagine the highways clogged with families fleeing the city, searching for areas with more stability or a rumored stash of supplies. This mass exodus could lead to further chaos, with competition for resources intensifying on the road and at potential destinations. Remember those folks we used to joke about? The ones with their survival bunkers and stockpiles? Well, by week three, they might not seem so crazy anymore. In fact, they might become a beacon of hope for some. Those who prepared for a worst-case scenario will likely have a better chance of weathering the storm. They might even become a source of support and guidance for others, forming small communities based on shared skills and resources. Without regular maintenance, infrastructure will start to crumble. Roads will become impassable. Power lines will sag and spark. And buildings could fall victim to neglect and the elements. Nature will slowly reclaim its territory. Those manicured lawns and neat sidewalks will be replaced by weeds and untamed vegetation. It'll be a stark reminder of humanity's dependence on a functioning system. Week three won't be all despair, though. In the face of adversity, human ingenuity often shines brightest. People will band together to solve problems, share resources, and create a sense of community. Neighbors might start community gardens, share knowledge on basic survival skills like fire starting or first aid, and look out for each other's safety. These small acts of cooperation will be seeds of hope in a bleak landscape. Week three is a pivotal point. It's a time when the initial shock wears off and the harsh realities of a collapsed society set in. It will be a test of our resilience, our resourcefulness, and our ability to work together. But within the chaos, there will be moments of hope, of human connection, that will remind us of our strength and our capacity to survive. All right, folks, now it's been a month since the collapse, and let me tell you, things are different. The initial shock, that flicker of hope, it's faded. We're living in a world that barely resembles the one we left behind. Remember all that cash you used to carry? Yeah, it's probably worthless now. Without a functioning government or banking system, money becomes just paper. People will be bartering for everything. Food, water, tools, even medical attention. It's a system as old as time itself. Think about it. That necklace you never wear? It could become the key to getting a bag of beans in this new normal. But here's the scary part. With no laws and no police, some places will turn into badlands. Think about those movies where gangs run the streets. Yeah, that's a possibility. These groups fill the void left by the government. And let's just say they're probably not really known for their kindness. The human cost of all this will be devastating. Estimates say that up to half the population in affected areas could die. Why? A perfect storm of problems. No clean water, limited food, and a lack of medical care. These things are bad enough on their own, but together, they're a death sentence for many. Imagine being sick and injured, with nowhere to turn for help. 
That's the reality for many in a collapsed society. It's a harsh comparison, but think about historical sieges or famines. People died by the thousands because of a lack of basic necessities. Now imagine that happening on a massive scale. That's what we're looking at here. But here's the thing. It's not all doom and gloom. In this new world, survival won't just depend on stockpiled supplies, it will depend on your ability to adapt, to learn new skills, and most importantly, to work with others. Remember that saying, there's no I in team? Well, in a collapsed society, the community becomes your lifeline. Helping each other and sharing resources, that's what will keep you going. Now, I know this picture I'm painting is grim, but knowledge is power. By understanding the potential challenges, you can start to prepare yourself mentally and physically for whatever comes your way. So far, I've painted a pretty stark picture of the first month after a collapse. Let me be clear, it won't be easy. It will be a physical and mental challenge, unlike anything most of us have ever faced. But here's the good news, you can prepare. And that preparation could make all the difference. Think about it. It's not about being a doomsday prepper living in a bunker. Although, hey, no judgment there. It's about taking some basic steps now that will give you a fighting chance when things get tough. So how do we do this? Let's break it down step by step. And to make it real, I'm going to share some of the things I do myself to prepare for any kind of disaster. Let's face it. Fancy gadgets and stockpiles are useless if you're not healthy enough to use them. Your physical and mental well-being are your most valuable assets. Imagine facing a world with no grocery stores, no pharmacies. How will you cope if you're already struggling with health issues? The stress alone would be a killer. Think about it. Constant worry, uncertainty, the threat of violence. All that takes a toll on your body. Your immune system weakens. You get sick easier. And pre-existing conditions can flare up. Diabetics, for example, could face serious complications without access to insulin. So what can you do? Start building your strength now. Focus on a healthy diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and lean protein. Cut down on processed foods. They'll just weigh you down. Exercise regularly, not just cardio, but also strength and flexibility training. Trust me, if you have to climb over a fence or haul heavy supplies, you'll be glad you did. And don't forget your mental health. Stress management is key. Learn some relaxation techniques like meditation, deep breathing, or yoga. A calm mind is a clear mind, and that will be crucial in a chaotic situation. Remember, a healthy body and a healthy mind go hand in hand. We all have a place to live, but in a collapse, a simple roof over your head won't be enough. Your home needs to become a fortress a safe haven for you and your loved ones. First things first, security. Think about every entrance point, doors, windows, anything a desperate person could try to get through. Reinforce those weak spots, maybe add some deadbolts or security bars. Studies show that homes with visible security measures are less likely to be targeted by burglars, and that principle applies here too. Next, consider the elements. Can your home handle extreme weather? If you live in a cold climate, you'll need to focus on insulation to keep the heat in. Think plastic sheeting on windows, draft stoppers for doors, and maybe some thermal curtains. Hotter climates require different tactics, reflective window films, good ventilation, and maybe even planting shade trees around your house. And don't forget alternative ways to heat and cool your home. A wood stove could be a lifesaver without access to central heating. For cooling, try creating airflow through open windows or using damp cloths to cool incoming air. Finally, take a good look at your home's structure. Are there any weak spots in the roof? Any unstable beams or foundations? Fix those problems now, before a crisis hits and makes them even worse. Remember, folks, preparing for a disaster isn't just about building a doomsday bunker. It's about taking some common sense steps to make yourself more resilient and more adaptable. It's about giving yourself the best chance to survive, to thrive, even in the face of the unexpected. Let's face it, without proper hygiene practices, disease can spread like wildfire. And in a crisis, the last thing you want is to be battling dysentery, 
often spread through contaminated food or water on top of everything else. So, how do we keep things clean? Well, it depends on your situation. If you have access to a decent water supply, you might be able to continue using your toilet by manually flushing it with buckets of water. But remember, water is precious, so use this method sparingly. Diverting gallons per day for flushing could leave you short for other needs. In urban areas, a more sustainable option might be a survival toilet, basically a bucket lined with a plastic bag. It's simple, but it requires a steady supply of bags and a plan for waste disposal. We're talking burying it deep in the ground, far away from your home and any other water sources. Contaminating your environment is definitely not the goal here. The best option, in my experience, is a composting toilet. These things are fantastic. They break down waste naturally, without needing water. You can set one up with a bucket filled with sawdust or peat moss, natural materials that absorb everything and promote decomposition. It's efficient, clean, and reduces the risk of disease. A triple win. And let's not forget about personal hygiene. Think about it. Dirty hands can spread germs and make you sick. So stock up on hand sanitizer, soap, toothpaste, and cleaning supplies. These might seem like basic items right now, but in a crisis, they become essential for staying healthy. Remember, folks, preventing illness is just as important as treating it. Regular hand washing is one of the simplest yet most effective ways to stop the spread of germs. The more you can wash your hands, the better. Remember, the first 30 days after a collapse will be a scramble for basic necessities. And the most basic necessity of all? Water. We all know how important water is. On average, an adult needs about a gallon a day, just for drinking. But that's not all. You need water for cooking, cleaning, and hygiene. All the things we take for granted right now. Now, the bad news. Once the collapse hits, the taps might run dry. That fancy filtration system under your sink? Useless without water. So, the first thing you need to do is fill every clean container you can with tap water while it's still flowing. Those jugs, bathtubs, even pots, fill them up. This could be your lifeline in the early days. But storing water isn't enough. You also need to be able to purify water from other sources. Rivers, rainwater, anything you can find. Why? Because your stored water might run out. The crisis might last longer than expected or you might have to leave your home. With a good filter, you can turn potentially dangerous water into something safe to drink. Think about it. Contaminated water can lead to serious diseases like cholera or typhoid. These types of diseases can be life-threatening, especially when there are no doctors around. There are different ways to purify water. Boiling it, using iodine tablets, or using special filters. Each method has its pros and cons, so it's a good idea to have a combination of them in your kit. Knowledge is key here. Learn how to use each method properly so you're prepared for any situation. And not scrambling to figure things out when you need it most. Now let's talk about food. Our bodies need fuel to function, and that fuel comes from calories. An average adult needs to consume around 2,000 calories a day. So, for the first month after a collapse, you're looking at around 60,000 calories for the average person. That giant chest freezer full of steaks? Not the best option. Remember, power outages are a sure thing in a collapse. Instead, focus on canned goods and dry staples like rice, beans, and pasta. These have long shelf lives and don't need refrigeration. Dehydrated or freeze-dried meals are also a good choice. Lightweight, easy to store, and you only need water to be ready. I keep a decent stock of freeze-dried and dehydrated ready-to-eat meals and snacks stored away in my basement, and I rotate my stock regularly to keep things as fresh as can be. But a word of caution, water might be scarce, so plan your meals accordingly. Think about learning how to forage for wild plants or even starting a small garden. Every little bit helps. Just remember, knowledge is key here too. You don't want to accidentally eat something poisonous. Hunting and fishing can also be options for getting fresh meat, but competition for these resources will be fierce. And don't forget about nutrition. A diet of nothing but canned beans will leave you weak and lacking essential vitamins. 
One option could be stocking up on some multivitamins. They can help prevent deficiencies that could make you sick, especially when there are no doctors around. Remember, folks, it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. You need the right fuel to keep your body and mind strong. So plan your food storage wisely, and try not to forget about the importance of a balanced diet. Let's shift gears and talk about security. This is a harsh reality, but in a collapsed society, you have to be on guard. People will be desperate, and that can lead to trouble. The choices you make here, helping others or staying isolated, can mean the difference between life and death. Helping others can build alliances, but it also comes with risk. On the other hand, staying alone might keep your supplies safe, but it could also mean missing out on help when you need it most. There's no easy answer, but here are some tips I use. Be prepared to defend yourself. Learn basic self-defense skills and consider having some kind of weapon for protection. But remember, use of force should always be a last resort. Another important part of security is to make sure your doors and windows are reinforced, and you have a plan for keeping intruders out. Think of it as creating a safe haven for yourself and your loved ones. Blend in, don't stand out, don't advertise your resources, keep things quiet, and avoid drawing attention to yourself at night. This might sound harsh, but in a survival situation, sometimes you have to make tough choices. Remember, folks, being prepared isn't about being paranoid. It's about being realistic and taking steps to protect yourself and your loved ones. Moving on to another crucial aspect of preparation, medical support. Remember, in a collapse, access to doctors and hospitals will vanish. That means you need to be self-sufficient when it comes to treating basic injuries and illnesses. Let's start with the essentials, a first aid kit. But not just your average drugstore variety, we're talking robust, stocked with everything from fever reducers and pain relievers to allergy meds and ointments. These are the things you'll need to treat common ailments and emergencies. And trust me, in a crisis, common becomes crucial. A few years back, I was on a camping trip with a couple of my friends and family. I remember we were hiking a pretty steep hill and my friend tripped and cut his leg badly. I personally always try to be prepared for anything. And well, I happened to have a first aid kit with me. I was able to clean the wound properly and bandage it up. Without having those supplies on hand, it could have easily gotten infected because we were several miles away from our original campsite. Now, beyond basic first aid supplies, bandages are your friend. Sterile bandages, gauze pads, adhesive strips, stock up on them all. Keeping wounds clean and dressed is critical, especially when there's no doctor around to stitch you up. Again, don't forget the power of knowledge. Include some comprehensive medical guides in your library. These books can be lifesavers, teaching you how to handle everything, from a simple sprain to a more complex medical situation such as a broken bone. Now let's talk about specific needs. If you have someone in your group with diabetes, for example, you need a plan to store their insulin. This might involve coolers with ice packs or even getting creative with underground storage in colder climates. The truth is, chronic health conditions won't disappear in a collapse. They'll just become harder to manage. According to the CDC, almost half of all adults in the US have one or more chronic conditions that require medication or treatment. Planning for these needs is essential, not optional. Now let's talk about something that is extremely crucial, community. Going it alone in a collapsed society? Not really a recipe for success. And no, it's not entirely impossible to go at it alone, but having a group of people to rely on makes a world of difference. Here's why. A group brings together a wider range of skills and strengths. One person might be great at fixing things, and another could be great at growing vegetables. Together, you can tackle challenges you might not be able to handle on your own. Sharing resources and building a durable, safe shelter, all these things become easier with a team. This is especially true in cities. Cities can be tough places in a crisis, full of competition and desperation. But if you have a network of people you trust, you can look out for each other, share what you have, and create a sense of security. So, how do you build this network? Start with your close circle, Family, friends, neighbors. These are the people you already know and trust. 
Local community groups can also be a good resource. The key is finding people who share your values and are willing to work together. Communication is also important. Figure out how you'll stay in touch, especially if phones and the internet aren't working, especially on how you'll make decisions, share resources, and resolve conflicts. Working together is key, and trust me, fairness goes a long way in maintaining a strong group. Remember, folks, humans are social creatures. We thrive in connection. Having a support system and people who care about you can make all the difference in your mental and emotional well-being during a crisis. So don't underestimate the power of community. It's not just about survival, it's about humanity. If you're looking to learn more about how to prepare for the first 30 days of a disaster, click the video on screen now where we talk about the 17 items you can't be without in an emergency.